Welcome to episode 40. This is the Libertarian Crusaders featuring the great Bill Kennedy, my brother, of course. So you know that he must be good. So uh, welcome, Phil. Um, it, you know, this is kind of an unusual uh, place for you to be, right? I'm used to you. I'm, I'm used to kind of being on your turf. But now technically, you're like on my turf, you know? So how does it feel? Well, I hope I fit in. I don't want to disappoint <laughs> you guys. You've all been good to me. <laughs> you know, especially Satoshi there. <laughs> and we have questions. Very kind. Yeah. <laughs> I know that uh, that put a little wind in your sails. <laughs> that went viral as far as Kennedy Financial is concerned. And a lot of people laid eyes on Cal Molinet for the first time. And they were like, man, who is this guy? So the thanks man. for doing that, man. I really appreciate it. <laughs> no, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we'll post the link later afterwards. But um, you have a great vision for putting these, uh, <laughs> these interesting... Uh, video, music videos together. Uh, and it didn't take that long. It took it was a good day to kind of film, a, film, film it all. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time. It, it was fun to make. Uh, frankly, we put more work into it than it was probably worth. That goes for all things Kennedy Financial. But the idea is that we are the Paul Revere of personal finance. We uh, need to be letting our friends, neighbors, loved ones know that a hyperinflationary depression is coming. And uh, whether it's gold, Bitcoin, whatever, everybody needs to be protecting themselves. I think we accomplished that. And uh, there's no doubt that anybody who's kind of on the end, the viewers and listeners of Libertarian Crusaders, when they saw that or if they see it down the road, they'll say, wow, you know, they brought all these different kinds of people together. Jeff Deist making a cameo in the thing. I think for anybody who was educated in a government school, they can watch that and be like, you know what? I don't think I understand everything that's going on. So good job. I think we accomplished that. Yeah. I think, I think as far as, uh, you know, when you first started this, that idea of Kennedy financial, I was living up in our, like Arlington and, um, we didn't really have any podcast equipment and I didn't really, I don't think I even listened to many podcasts at the time. Uh, what was that like five years ago? Yeah. We started in, May of 2015, John was doing improv at the time. And I had this idea, you know, he and I, like any brothers, we have phone conversations all the time. Sometimes they last, you know, 30 minutes, an hour, where we just rant <laughs> on this Keynesian Orwellian hellhole of a society that we're living through. And interest rates had already been locked at zero since 2009. And we were coming up on an election year. And I said to myself, you know, John, people would probably want to hear what we're talking about. And I was like, yeah, I think they would. Let's start a podcast. So we did and nobody listened for the longest time. And then by episode 100, we finally had Ron Paul, the great Ron Paul on. And that got more attention. And then we started getting more influential people on from the gold, Bitcoin, Austrian economic space. And uh, now I think we're up to 340 episodes but uh, we're going to finally wind things down. I guess I, I can explain why later. But the really we, the economy and the financial system that we're living through is really unparalleled. And I think we take it for granted because this is only our only crack at life. You know, we only get to do this once. And for all of us, we probably know people who think this is normal. I was at a birthday party last year. It was like March, May of 2019. And it was with a bunch of guys that I went to high school with. And talk about Greenspan's famous saying, irrational exuberance. All these guys, man, we were at a brewery up there on Route 15 near Leesburg. The place was packed. It was a Saturday. It was just, you know, like the roaring 20s. And uh, one, one of our classmates is doing exceptionally well. I think because he was an appointee in the Obama administration who then leveraged that afterward. And he has a nice Falls Church home, you know, the whole nine. It's, it's beautiful. It's probably, you know, worth millions of dollars. And I'm trying to explain to these guys, you know, what happens if interest rates go up? 
And uh, the, the guy whose birthday party we were celebrating said, oh, listen to Rand Paul over here. You yeah. know, the record player is like, <laughs> yeah. everybody's like looking at him like, what? Right. What are you talking like, about, dude? Like that famous photo that somebody took at a party with all the girls hold, holding the uh, red party cups and they're all just like, yeah. So our peers really don't want to hear this. The four of us right now on the show are kind of outliers. We're, we're the weirdos. but. I think we're going to be proven right in the long run. And that's why it's important to continue doing these episodes in the podcast, because if not, if people don't listen now, then at least they'll have a place to go to five, 10 years from now, or maybe even 18 months from now and look back and say, well, who are the guys that got it right? You know, uh, before the, we went live here, I was talking about uh, my acquaintance, Jimmy Morrison, who directed the bubble film. And now he's producing another documentary and he laid out like a one and a half hour, two hour indictment on Greenspan, Bernanke, the fed. And you can look at that and no matter what side of the political aisle you're on, you can watch that and say, Oh yeah, it was the federal reserve. This bubble can be strictly laid at their feet. So we're living through it all over again. We need to keep talking about it. But uh, the concern I have, and I wanted to post pitch to you guys, is John knows I become increasingly pessimistic to now where I've reached the point of indifference. I think that the number of people, you know, you talk uh, that back to that Paul Revere analogy, the number of people who are worth saving at this point (laughs) are few and far between. Nobody has woken from their slumber, nobody has much less reach for their rifle and climb to top their steed. <laughs> no one is joining us in this fight. And I've reached the point where I think that we're probably going, secession is the only option on the table. We, we have nothing but irreconcilable differences. So I wanted to kind of pitch that back to you guys. And, you know, where, where are we heading financially? Do you have any hope? Well, um, I'm a Catholic, so I don't believe in divorce. Um, and, uh, separation, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think, um, as you're mentioning, uh, things have, uh, escalated pretty fast on the timeline I was thinking of many years ago, uh, to the point, uh, I guess this is like before Trump got in or like right around the time, I guess the escalation of violence is coming from the, from the left, um, uh, where, you know, I never really saw that sort of stuff in, in the nineties, you know, when I was a kid, uh, or early, uh, 2000. Um, so, you know, I guess there's a, there's a thing you can say, like, uh, like maybe there's enough time to reach out to people and you look at the state of the current events. It's like, mm, maybe it's, uh, there's just enough time to just uh, take care of ourselves and <laughs> make sure at least our ship is good to go. And if we find more awesome people along the way, great. But I think, uh, focus of our resources and directions would be towards that. And as you're mentioning, like, the, your, the shows that you've done are maybe in a way like a time capsule for people to kind of see and look upon it. I look at it like that too. Um, like all the videos I've done over the many years are like uh, a way for people who want to know these uh, answers to these questions. They can look at them and are able to maybe convey it to other people. But I look at it also as a way like one day I'll have kids <laughs> and, and this is a great way for them to see how, you know, how, what their father did and better understand and learn how uh, the world was like back then too. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, I'm, I'm not ready to like abandon ship and those, that's inevitable, but you know, I think the, the conversation about like the collapse of, you know, this hyperinflation has been, it has been a hot topic for a good number of years. And I've seen it being discussed since like the eighties and, uh, people thinking, saying that it will collapse, it will collapse, but you know, it's uh, 20, 30 years later and people are still saying that. So i at this point, I'm, I don't know when it will collapse. Um, but, but that's, that's a good topic to grow into, uh, in a second. Yeah. I'd, like, yeah. What do you say, Kurt? There? Well, I just think that, uh, <clears throat> calm waters don't make for good sailors. So this is how we, this is just the reality that's been, it's not our fault that the fed did this. We've been ringing the alarm bell the whole time. And like you said, like Cal said, summed it up into it's a time capsule. And so during the 2008 collapse, I was just coming out of high school or about to come out of high school. Maybe I was two years graduated. 
I thought the only economic opportunity was military. So that's what I ended up doing. But now that I've done that and looked back, I can't, that is literally like the only option I would never choose now because I don't want to be a tool for them where they have their thumb on me and they are controlling my funds. At least with my freedom, I'm capable of wielding my resources the way that I choose and building a parallel system to be more of a, a lighthouse uh, against that versus, you know, we've done the best we can to do, do the midnight ride. You know, a lot of people were asleep. That's unfortunate. So we just start building. Yeah. Well, I think one of the reasons I've become increasingly despondent is due to the fact that we're now witnessing how people behave when the government has pretty much absolute control, you know, getting confronted in a grocery store <laughs> by someone because you don't have a mask on. Can you imagine what they'll do when things get really serious? I mean, we will be living in a Soviet style hellhole <laughs> where you can yeah. essentially be picked up and thrown in a van for not maybe wearing a mask. I really see that where things are going, but I've been saying in the recent months that it's very clear that there's one side and they're the non-libertarians who are now finally living out their lifelong dream of telling other people what to do. And you see that from the leftist governors on down. I mean, I joked with John that if someone confronts you, whether it be at a Walgreens or a Harris Teeter or something about not wearing your mask, just retort my body, my choice, because you can be rest assured that that's a leftist you're dealing with who has no problem snuffing out the life of an innocent baby, right? They have no problem with that. So they're going to, you're going to, they're going to take a step back. They, they're very familiar with that saying, my, oh, well, my body, my choice. And uh, by the way, you know, why are you within two feet of me having this conversation when I'm not wearing a mask? You obviously, it's more about telling me what to do, isn't it? So right. it's a power that, trip. Yeah. That, that's why I'm increasingly despondent. I didn't know that we had an entire subset of fellow citizens who'd be willing to do that so quickly. We, I've been watching more of the Twilight Zone recently because I feel like we're living it. And in fact, our uncle told me to watch this uh, episode. It was in the first season. It's called uh, something about Maple Street. And the idea is that an alien is living amongst them. And within a few short hours, this very nice community begins to start killing one another because they're trying to figure out who the alien is and they're all pointing the finger at one another. I think that's where we've gone. And uh, I think all the more reason to opt out. Um, I, I had a guest on my show today who's a younger guy and he's been buying gold ever since he first started figuring out, you know, what exactly is the Federal Reserve and what have they done to our money? And he says he wishes he had more time. And I'm like, hey, man, I can sure sympathize with you. I mean, John and I have been doing Kennedy Financial since 2015. And we've been trying to get our hands on as much of the real stuff as we can. And we still wish we had more time. But I think... Don't get your gold from China, right? Yeah. It might have tungsten on the inside. I, I think the four of us here and your viewers and listeners are far more prepared than the average person. I mean, just look at the way they ran out to buy toilet paper when this thing kicked off. Yeah. Right. I think, um, uh, a lot of things that I guess they're going to be caught unprepared. Uh, well, if they bought toilet paper, maybe that might leave the tours a lifestyle of, uh, of prepping, you know, and that's a thing that's kind of resurging, uh, in a way kind of preparing. Cause if there's going to be a collapse, is there, if there's going to be a devalue of a basement of currency, kind of like the German marks, um, food's going to be scarce. And, you know, I, that's another way, you know, not just libertarians, but preppers are able to say, I told you so, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how did you get involved in all of this in the beginning though? How did you get into uh, economics or Austrian economics or what, what led you towards this path? And what was your, I guess, people, libertarians always ask like, how did you get through libertarianism? H how did you find, uh, this path yourself? I mean, you're, o you're older than John. So I would imagine you introduced this a lot older, <laughs> way older than me. He's old. <laughs> I look way older than John. <laughs> I'm only seven years older than John. This right here, um, for the folks who might be listening rather than viewing, I have pretty much white hair. I'm only seven years older than John, but this is in John's future. So 
believe it or not, John was pretty instrumental in helping me find libertarianism. I think he may have been the first guy to utter the name Ron Paul to me. And before that, he had mentioned a guy named Tom Tamcredo, who I don't know oh, yeah. if, relatively speaking, he's as libertarian, but he certainly was an outlier in terms of Republicans. And of course, the media was just absolutely excoriating him. And by the time there was the Giuliani moment, uh, John had already mentioned Ron Paul to me. And I was probably still somewhat of a neocon back then. I still wanted to believe that we needed to be in the Middle East and preserving democracy and trying to hold elections in Iraq and all that nonsense. But when he did that, he had the Ron Paul, the Giuliani moment. I thought, man, that took a lot of guts. And so I started looking into it more. And then we had the housing bubble and the financial crisis. And Tom Woods came out with his book, Meltdown, which was a New York Times bestseller. So it was an excellent avenue for ordinary people to finally discover Mises, uh, libertarianism, the gold standard, guys like Peter Schiff. And that's really what opened my eyes to everything that's going on. And uh, basically now I'm a full-fledged ANCAP. John and I try to compete with one another to see who can uh, be even more libertarian than the other. We've completely surpassed our father, who's just a regular conservative. We, we took a He's test. He's like, you're both anarchists. Yeah. <laughs> anarchists. <laughs> yeah, we took a test. There was like some libertarian test that John found. And uh, John and I nearly scored a perfect score. And our dad got like an 82%. And uh, we, we joke that, you know, he's not, we, we have to now question his libertarian credentials. Yeah. But yeah, those, those are my avenues. And I think that is a testament to the fact that even though sometimes in this space, it doesn't feel like we're changing hearts and minds, you really only have to change a few. And you begin to discover, as John did coming back from the uh, LP convention, that you're reaching more people than you think. So even though, yes, I am discouraged and I'm going to wind down the show, uh, mainly because I feel like the tech tyrants have won. It doesn't mean that we aren't winning some of the right people to our side. So yeah, let, let that encourage folks and keep it up. Yeah. The, uh, I remember I first heard about Ron Paul through, uh, Pat Buchanan. I was really into Pat Buchanan and uh, I'm still, I mean, I still like Pat Buchanan. Um, I'll read his stuff, but at, at the time, I was really into Pat Buchanan, and he was talking about the gold standard. And he was like, there's some congressman talking about the gold standard. And I had no idea what that was. And so that was what led me to, to talk about Ron Paul. And then also Pat Buchanan was uh, anti-interventionist, uh, anti-interventionist conservative. So it was unusual. And uh, he had come to my college in like 2008, 2009. Or, yeah. No, no, 2005, that. 2005, 2004 or so. So uh, it is interesting, yeah, the way you end up. Um, but, you know, a lot of people would say Ron Paul, Pat Buchanan, totally different. But on that, those couple of issues, which are the, some of the most important issues, you know, they were, they were very similar. So, uh, yeah, that, that was interesting. You got into Peter Schiff, too, as I recall. And uh, he influenced you a lot. And then, and that got in, then it got into Silver... And he was big on silver, right? Yeah. In fact, I was looking to see if I had his book, The Real Crash, here. That, <laughs> that book by Tom Woods mentioned Peter Schiff in like the first 10 pages. And so they said anybody who goes on YouTube can't deny that Peter Schiff has been saying that this was a bubble for the last several years. So I watched that Peter Schiff was right video and I was like, holy smokes, this guy was spot on. Well, it turned out I had already read his book, Crash Proof like a year or two before. And I just didn't really realize who he was or what he was saying. And when you go back and read that, you're like, I think it's chapter four, all about what will happen and how Fanny and Freddie will need a bailout. It was almost like he was writing in a past tense or, you know, he, he predicted every single step that the government would take in the aftermath of the bubble bursting. So yeah, he, he's right on that. I still give him uh I, I, a little, I troll him from time to time back when I was on Twitter about his stance on Bitcoin. It, it's clear that Bitcoin is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It is a trustless, immutable, decentralized ledger and complementary to gold. You can use your Bitcoin to buy gold from Atmex. So uh, I think that's the only blind spot that Peter Schiff has. But 
to date, I mean, he's still out there trying to convince everybody that this is going to be a greater depression. So far, I don't have any evidence to see how he's wrong. I think, in fact, he is probably underestimating. All of us are probably underestimating how bad this is going to be when it finally plays out because we don't really know what happens to the United States after we lose the world reserve currency status on the dollar. Coupled with the fact that we blew up this enormous bubble with artificially low interest rates, rates are supposed to tell people whether there's enough savings in the economy to pursue different projects. I mean, John works in the real estate market. It's very intuitive. I mean, if the low interest rate is sending a false signal telling people, hey, you should pursue this project. There's enough savings to make it worthwhile to bring about a profit. And then that turns out to not be the case. All of these new businesses are going to go under. And the ones I like to pick on most, because we all probably know somebody like one or two degrees away in separation are these craft breweries and these boot camp style gyms. I mean, you, you can't go around the block without tripping over one. And I'm not picking on those as a business because I think they're great. And I love craft beer. All I'm saying is, do you remember in your teens, these places being absolutely everywhere? And I'm not saying that there isn't a market for them in certain cities or metropolitan areas. What I'm saying is, do you think that maybe if we had real rates, there might be less of them, you know, cause these are, these are types of businesses that are someone's dream. You know, it's like what you talked about when you were hanging with your bros, cracking a few back in college. Wouldn't it be cool if we all opened a craft brewery? And the reality is, is that there is no sustainable demand for these things, especially when we're talking about social distancing and all that stuff. All these places are going to go under. And, I, and again, I'm not just picking on those two, but I use them as an example. So we're going to learn a hard economic lesson and it's not going to be fixed overnight. I think that what we are facing as a country now is worse than the depression because it lasted so much longer. It got so much bigger and it was on the heels of two other major financial bubbles, dot com bubble and the housing bubble. So this is the coup de gras, man. This is it. And, uh, us, us uh, four right here, we might not consider staying in the United States or what's the current United States, you know? We might think about moving to Puerto Rico or Malta or Wyoming, <laughs> you know, someplace where there's real opportunity and prosperity. And uh, I'm, I'm afraid that it's not going to be in states that have underfunded pensions by half. And uh, miss out on being uh, the warlord of Richmond. Uh, <laughs> uh, isn't there a way like, you know, the, the Germans had had their uh, currency um, devalued in terms of the amount of, that they were printing in, in those Bill Bur that we see in all those book photos. Um, couldn't the United States just uh, declare bankruptcy and then emerge like as the integrated uh, states of America under a new name and uh, roll out a new currency with uh, different presidents on it? And then just kind of erase the uh, trillions of dollars in debt. Like how do, how do countries do that? Like countries that are no longer those governments anymore, a new government emerges and then a new currency comes out. And that kind of seems to kind of work out for them for in the beginning, right? Temporarily. But the reality is think about anyone who goes through a bankruptcy. How credit worthy are they in the years afterward? I mean, anytime they have to fill out a mortgage application or a job application, it asked, you know, have you ever declared bankruptcy? It's almost like the scarlet letter. And how quick are countries around the world going to be willing to buy our debt at that point? Um, I mean, all we have to do is look at the world's last superpower, the UK, right? London has basically turned into third world occupied territory. So there's no real good news in the years afterward, you end up selling off your assets at fire sale prices. I mean, it's not a coincidence that the UK sold its gold when it was like under 300 bucks 
you know, how nice would it yeah. be for them to have that now? But the United States is insolvent. We are already broke. If we weren't, then we would already have normalized interest rates. We would have ended QE. We wouldn't be talking about a second stimulus package because ordinary Americans would have savings. So we are the collective of all of our individuals. And most individuals don't have 400 bucks saved for emergency. We got a lot of people riding in our wagon and very few pulling. It's, uh, it's very bad. It's not going to get better. I don't think declaring you know, the strong dollar. Okay, we got rid of that phony weak dollar. Now we got a strong dollar and we put Michelle Obama on it. So everybody <laughs> feels good. It's not going to fix anything. We are in serious trouble. So it, we all have to opt out. Couldn't they do what China's doing and do the uh, tungsten filled uh, gold bars? <laughs> As it looks, they look at all that gold. Uh, well, Diocle Diocletian. Right. Yeah. We verified it ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Well, now Cal Moline, AKA Satoshi is getting to why I'm such a huge Bitcoin bull. This is the evolution in technology that is Bitcoin. And this is why I think they're complementary. The gold and silver market have been manipulated and suppressed for decades. And that's why I've had Bill Murphy as a guest on my show. And the guys at GATA have done excellent work trying to explain to people why the real stuff should be valued in dollar terms far higher than it currently is. But as Bill Murphy says, the U.S. would sooner give up their nuclear codes than what the real price of gold and silver should be, because that is an indictment on the U.S. dollar. If gold were $10,000 today and an ounce of silver was like 500 bucks, even your typical kid who had been indoctrinated in his local government school would realize, Hey, you know, this is a serious problem. Like, you know, uh, a year ago I was able to buy a candy bar for a buck and now it's like 50 bucks. So they want to keep a cap on gold and silver as long as they can. The reality is, is that Bitcoin is a transparent ledger that the whole world can see. And despite its volatility, because it is the world's newest financial innovation, it still offers us the ability in the long run to have an accounting information system for all the world's goods and services. You know, John works with general ledgers and P&Ls and balance sheets all the time. A company has no idea whether it's profitable or not without keeping track of its inventory, accounts receivable, accounts payable, all those great things. But we just accept that, you know, some guys in London every day are deciding what the gold and silver price is. And I think what we're going to find out in this next crisis is that when people finally stand for delivery, okay, um, you know, we are Argentina and we'd like our gold back now, please. Like Germany did several years ago and it took like nearly a year for them to get, I think it was 700 tons or something like that, which is a lot, but it's not a lot in terms of, you know, we supposedly have 8,000 tons at Fort Knox. When they find out- How much out, is in the Richmond uh, Federal Reserve? <laughs> if I just, I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't know. Let us It'd be worth knowing. Just uh, When we find out that the cupboards are bare, I think that's going to, first off, send the crypto market into a frenzy. Because at least when it comes to crypto, we know there will only be 21 million Bitcoin, 84 million, Litecoin. These are small numbers when you consider the global financial system. There's just so much room for them to run. And that's why I continuously say gold and Bitcoin are complementary. And if you are a gold or silver bug, which I imagine you guys have a lot in the audience, it doesn't mean you have to like Bitcoin. It just means you have to accept that there is something that it offers. It is an evolutionary system in finance because it's triple entry bookkeeping. You know, there's the debit, there's the credit, and then there's the blockchain. So this is something that we've never had before. I think that uh, even though it has been volatile, we have been in mostly a bear market since 2017. I think we're on the uptrend now. A lot of people got burned on the downside. People will continue to amass enormous fortunes playing into the Bitcoin system, opting out of their local fiat currencies. Mind you, this isn't just something that's happening to the dollar, right? I mean, I, I joke with uh, John's friend, Andy, 
you know, it's, I always get nervous every, t- every morning when I see that Bitcoin's pumping, pumping in South Korea won, right? <laughs> you got a bunch of teenagers over there. But the reality is, is that every human being on the planet, I mean, if, if you're a poor guy living in Venezuela or Africa, you are still eligible to participate in this system and potentially change your life. So uh, that, that's why I keep bringing up Bitcoin. And uh, I, I just see it as a positive for the gold and silver market. Right. I was going to ask, um, what kind of leads to, or in terms of Bitcoin, uh, being the poverty of, uh, this economic collapse that's, uh, incoming, uh, you know, what should people, how should people prepare themselves? You know, so they, uh, load up on a lot of debt and, uh, you know, will that, you know, just disappear on its own? Uh, <laughs> what, yeah. what is it called? Leveraging the something? I forget Harvesting we were talking. your equity. <laughs> yeah. That was a term from the 2008 financial crisis. So, John and I, our maternal grandfather, he worked hard his entire life. He had an eighth grade education. He ended up being maybe a regional general manager for a line of grocery stores up in upstate New York. And uh, unfortunately, got liver disease in his mid 60s and uh, succumbed to it. But before he passed away, he said one of his biggest regrets was not getting into more debt. You know, might as well, you know, get into more debt late in life. Everybody knows you're not going to pay it off. And uh, it's only in adulthood that I realized just, you know, how bad I felt for him because he felt trapped in this evil Keynesian technocratic system that we're all stuck in, run by bankers who are complete psychopaths and have no feeling for you or I. And I think intuitively, this is the feeling that a lot of Americans have. Like, I, there, no, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm not going to get myself out. But I think getting into debt, uh, with the exception of maybe a house that you can walk away from if it just suddenly goes under, uh, you know, if you're upside down. With the exception of that, I think it's, you're playing with fire. And we've now seen that with student loans. Uh, I think all those are going to end up getting a bailout because we just can't leave our young people encumbered with debts that they can't ever pay off. And it's, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, but I think it's imperative upon all of us to realize that no one's coming to save us. We all have to do a monthly budget. We got to sit down with our loved one and say, okay, this is what we plan on bringing in this month. And this is our regular set expenses. These are fixed. You know, what's variable? Okay, how much do we have left to put into savings? This is something that nobody does. And this is how Dave Ramsey has gotten so famous because he insists on it. You know, this is an area where he's right. We should all have at least maybe three months saved up as an emergency fund. Uh, We should all get rid of our credit card and uh, only use a debit card. Frankly, I'll admit that I'm somewhat hypocritical on that because as a forensic account fraud examiner, I have a little bit of a concern about having that number stolen. So uh, my wife and I keep it separate and, you know, we agree on the purchases and things like that. Plus with Amazon nowadays, it's just better to have that be the card rather than debit card. You know, I'm willing to negotiate with people on that one. But the reality is, is since none of us do a budget, we all overspend every month, just like our government does. And at the end of a lifetime, a lot of us, have nothing to show for all of those years of leaving our families, commuting back and forth and working for slave wages. And it's because we thought that someone would ride in to save us. I mean, look at the boomers, right? They all think that social security was going to be there for them. And sure, now they're getting every dollar that they were promised. But what do those dollars buy? They hardly buy anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Kurt, what were you saying? Well, I think that this just proves that, uh, you know, it's every time they're going to intervene. And now more than ever, it's these two fake parties that are really no different from each other fighting each other for control. And if they would just let go of control, the problem would have the opportunity to attempt to fix itself. People would be glad to, you know, the people that had money saved up would be glad to loan to other people if there weren't all of these arbitrary laws and everything like that getting in the way, trying to siphon out all the resources. 
pushing down the value of the money to begin with because it's not from the market anyway. And like you said, this, this gold, the silver, and the Bitcoin, these are quite obviously the parallel systems that are being you know, constructed by us just by gravitating towards things that we know are reasonable and will work. Yeah, the, I think, uh, was it Spooner, Lysander Spooner, who talked about he, um, the socialists will try and claim him as one of their own. And uh, it's always funny when they do that because he points out that it's wrong for the Rothschilds and these wealthy families to um, loan their money out to the government uh, to get these guaranteed rates when they could loan to regular people and uh, make loans to regular people. And, um, you know, he says, well, and also it's wrong to, uh, to loan money at or to not let people loan money at whatever rate they want, you know, and, and, and that's another funny thing about uh, socials, but it's, you know, the, I think, I think going back to that issue, I think it's like there, there is something to be said for, um, having free markets in those types of lending practices because people will try to criticize you for it. But you just say like, it's got to come in at some rate and then it will get better from there. Uh, if, you know, people start developing a uh, financial sense and start realizing, and, you know, and they start rejecting credit cards. The more people reject a credit card and refuse to use them, then these companies got to compete and maybe lower their rates a little bit, you know, and start saying, okay, maybe we'll only do it at 8% and, uh, or, or 5% or whatever. And then it gets to be, um, you know, a little more competitive maybe, but yeah, at, at, at uh, the current rates that they charge, it's ridiculous. And you would, you know, if you were to get into credit card debt, you're in, you're in at 20%, you know, or something annually. So, uh, it, it, it's just, it's just uh, no brainer advice, you know, and, uh, people will sometimes, come up with strategies to try and suggest that you get into debt uh, to, I, I mean, if you're a business, I could see, see it, you know, I could see like, we, we got a business loan. Uh, we're doing a loan draw in order to build this home. And then we're going to sell the home in, in three months for, uh, you know, way more than the loan was worth. Uh, but the average person isn't doing that. Right. So um, that, that's the issue. <laughs> yeah. No, the average person's in debt up to their eyeballs. They have no savings. If dad lost his job, the family would be absolutely destitute. It's really very pessimistic outlook, but we are, again, as I said before, we are a collection of our individuals. And even CNBC is willing to report that most boomers don't have $10,000 saved for retirement. Well, what do you think they're depending on? Well, they have the promise of social security and they're all going to start drawing at the age of 65 and you're going to help pay for their golden years. And the fact is though, those tables, I bet you they look great in the 1960s, but the dollar has been so devalued since then. In fact, I had a statistic for you guys that I wanted to share. So without divulging John's birthday, because that wouldn't be good OPSEC, John's birthday is somewhere in the first half of 2019. That would give away all of my uh, passwords. So yeah, yeah, don't do that. So when Cal, John, and I, and Vince filmed Zero, it was in, again, the first half of 2019. On the day he did it, I think Bitcoin was around four grand. If you count the number of days between then and now and divide that by the $11,000, $11,000 Bitcoin price of today, it's gone up seven grand since then. It's gone up $14 a day. <laughs> this is an indictment on our current monetary system. We finally have the ability to save in real money. Again, gold and silver used to be real money and they still are, but because of the manipulation that takes place by JP Morgan and the COMEX and the LBMA. We don't know what their real price should be. And we got a taste of that in the late seventies. We finally had a taste when gold ran up to 800 bucks and silver ran to 50. When we experience that again, gold today or silver today rather is only 25 bucks. It's under the 1980 price. Gold is at least more than double the 1980 price. 
when we finally get to see these markets run, I think we'll easily see three digit silver. Uh, you know, I've speculated that it should have been 500 bucks by now. John knows that I've been wrong on a lot of things that that's certainly one of them. But I think it's because they're able to manipulate it because who wants to accept delivery of, I don't know, like 80 million silver eagles, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to take delivery of that. So it's one of these commodities where there's never an actual delivery. Imagine if it, we were talking about soybeans, wheat, any other commodity, you know, there eventually has got to be a delivery. It's, it's not necessarily that case for gold and silver, but it will be. And I think that's what's going to bring down this entire Ponzi scheme. And we might finally get to see where silver runs. When that happens, we don't have a Paul Volcker style Federal Reserve chairman who's got the back of a President Reagan, or rather President Reagan having his back. He, no president is going to allow their Fed chairman to run interest rates up to the point that they break the back of gold and silver. So, 100%. yeah. So gold and silver, the prices in dollar terms are pretty much limitless. In the meantime, play the game with Bitcoin. Wait, you know, don't go head over heels with it. Uh, certainly, if you're over the age of 60, uh, you shouldn't be buying any altcoins if you're over 60. I think most of your audience is probably under that age. I think yeah, we actually are really strong on the over 55 community oh, good. in this podcast. <laughs> I think everybody should make it their personal goal to try to accumulate one Bitcoin if they can. And the reality is, if even your entire audience tried to do that, I think the price of Bitcoin would be like $20,000 by tomorrow. So uh, it's probably not possible, but that should try, everyone should try to make that their goal and do it, do it sooner rather than later, because I think we're heading to a new all time high. Again, it's gone up $14 a day in the last 18 months. Is that about right, John? It's been 18 months since you had that birthday. Yeah, that doesn't seem that long ago, but right. Man. And by the way, we had an extraordinary pump in the meantime. It went up to fourteen thousand dollars by June, so it went up ten grand in about three months. The, these are the kind of moves that we can see when the herd starts to realize that this is the future of money. Amen. Right? Yeah, I I agree that I tell the same thing to a lot of people. Just at least work up towards one Bitcoin, save it, you're set. Uh, if you don't, your children, children, your future children will look at you and must create disappointment because they'll say in 2020, you had an opportunity to start getting them at that price. <laughs> it's $200,000 now, right? right. <laughs> it's $500,000. And I was like, I can't believe you dad. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be extremely disappointed. I think we could be at six figures in the next two years or, uh, what's or the zero <laughs> somewhere in between. What's the name of the guy that'll eat his genitals if it's not? Oh yeah. That anniversary came and went. Uh, I, I reported that to John. There, you know, he was a former libertarian candidate, by the way. And uh, it was supposed to be on national television. I did not find the channel. So I don't know if he uh, went through with that bet. <laughs> Wait, what, what was it? Uh, that was the... John McAfee. John McAfee. He probably ate all <laughs> his cocaine, not his dick. So <laughs> he got confused. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to say thank you so much for being on the Libertarian Crusaders show. And I think a lot of the things that you've, you've done in your show is uh, helpful for a lot of people. Hopefully you, you keep it up there as well as a time capsule, as we were discussing earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, people are, this does feel like it's getting closer and closer to that inevitable hyperinflation collapse. Uh, what will that look like? I think, uh, well, look towards South America to see how they've experienced it. And that's a repeated experience that they've, the people there have, have had uh, like generationally uh, here, the last time people have had a, a somewhat of a close experience with maybe the depression um, this, you know, this country doesn't have that kind of memory that is generally a day to day thing in other places. So yeah, I think a lot of people will be caught ill prepared, but um, you don't have to be. And I think uh, you do a good job in providing that information to people being that part of here. Um, with those listening, just, um, stay liberated. Get off my property. Print guns, not money. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. God bless. <laughs>